I know you didn't come here this morning to hear me speak, so I'd like to introduce our special guest today, Joe Iyer. Joe has been the executive director of Los Altos Community Foundation for six years. Uh, he's been a tremendous influence on a lot of the nonprofits in this area, and so I'd like to turn it over to Joe. But anyways, I'd like to begin by, um, I don't know if, if any of you remember the uh, little child, children's story called Seven Blind Mice. The, the idea is where these mice are by a pond and some big object comes by them and one, one mouse goes up there one day and finds what they think is a pillar and it turns, you know, it's, it's not a pillar. And another one goes up and finds what they think is a snake and another goes up and finds the next day what they think to be a fan. Another one goes up the next day and thinks they find what is a rope. And finally, the smart mouse at the end goes and looks at the whole thing and finds out it's an elephant, right? It's the pillar was the leg, the snake was the trunk, the fan was the ear, the rope was the tail. So um, the, the moral of the story, they state in the book, is you know, knowing a piece of the tale is good for a, a good story, but knowing the whole picture is, is wisdom. So most of you have been involved with the Community Foundation in one way or another, and you, because you're also active in the community. What I want to try to do today is try to give an overview of the foundation so you have the bigger picture of what it's all about and, and what we do. And also, more importantly, the services we offer for our community, because we're here to enable you and others to be philanthropic and engaged in the community. And we offer a lot of services that people have taken advantage of over the years and can do in the future. I did this cartoon just because if you want to make a difference, come visit us. Uh, so back in 1990, uh, a local attorney, Jim Reynolds, convened a number of people, Roy and others, and um, said that there was individuals, clients of his, who wanted to create a fund that they could give back to as a planned gift to help the community forever. And that was kind of the genesis of the foundation. And that's what a lot of community foundations are about. Anybody have any idea how many community foundations are around the US? 5,000. Or, about, or is it about 900. And then there's about double that internationally. And uh, where is the biggest community foundation? Where is the biggest community foundation in the U.S.? That's right. It's about it's about two miles away. Silicon Valley Community Foundation. And um, people might say, why do we exist? We exist because we're very locally focused. They're operating more typically more at the regional and global level. So we're partners with them. So, anyways, that was the beginning, and we uh, were founded in 1991. Uh, our mission is very simple. We're trying to inspire, lead, and empower individuals and organizations for a stronger community. And the uh, primary activities we're doing, but this is not the only activities, is we give a lot of grants to nonprofits and community initiatives. We have managed programs that inspire philanthropy and community building. We incubate new startup nonprofits through our fiscally sponsored program, and I'm going to cover all these in more detail. Uh, we offer a number of funds, donor advised funds and others. We bring groups together and then we um, host a lot of events. We're serving residents, private foundations and businesses in the three communities of Los Altos, Los Altos Hills and Mountain View. What we do in those communities is what I say is appropriate. What we do here is different than what we do in Mountain View and what we do in Los Altos Hills. We're doing what's appropriate. But we feel that these three communities are really tied together in a lot of ways and it makes sense to um, look at them all together. Some people don't really understand what's the difference between a private foundation and a community foundation. A private foundation often focuses on just a few needs maybe anywhere around the world. You know. Uh, malaria in Africa or whatever. We're focusing on whatever needs are relevant in our community and different needs come and go over time. So needs that were, um, uh, should I move? <laughs> needs that were relevant in the 90s have come and gone and then we have current needs that are different today. And so we're adapting to those and we're often the first organization to enable somebody to work on these. Uh, who funds, typically with a private foundation like the Gates Foundation, Packer Foundation, it's a wealthy individual, right? Um, 
We're the People's Foundation. We count on many donations from many donors around the community to allow us to do the work we do. Primary activities, typically private foundations grant to other nonprofits who do the work on the ground. We do that, but then we also have our programs, funds, and convening. So we're enabling community members to pool their resources in a way that we can do more than any one person can do alone. And that's what, one of the real strengths of a community foundation. And we also connect uh, needs of the community with nonprofits and donors. Uh, last year we gave out about uh, 1.8 million overall grants and scholarships. Most of those went to our three communities, Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, and Mountain View. Um, a number went to the Bay Area, so this is Bay Area outside of our three communities, and then some went beyond the Bay Area. Most of these are donor advised funds. Uh, donor advised funds allow people to grant to any nonprofit in the U.S., and so some, non some of our donor advised fund owners grant to you know, a church or their college or wherever, um, as long as it's a nonprofit um, somewhere in the U.S. So we gave out about 321 grants um, to 208 nonprofits. So a lot of, you know, duplicate uh, grants, maybe from the donor advised fund, maybe our community grants program. So in uh, three communities, we gave out 1.2 million. And about 200,000 of that is what we call our community grants. And a lot of you are familiar with that. That's where twice a year we solicit applications for, for grant requests. And we have a grants committee of local residents who evaluate the grants and then give those out. And those are typically five to $10,000. Those have been um, funded by two local foundations. Uh, the Packard Foundation has given us a regranting grant since 2007. Heising Simons Foundation is also giving us a grant. Heising Simons is up here at um, uh, First and Main. Uh, the purple is our donor advised funds. So again, for those of you who may not be familiar, a donor advised fund is kind of like a, a, a simple lightweight fam family foundation. So instead of creating your own private foundation where you have to administer it, set it up, file tax returns and all that, you can contribute to LACF and you have this fund and then you can grant out of it um, over time. The advantage is you can put money in, get a tax deduction right, right away, and then you can grant out of it over time. And that's, that's uh, these grants here. And then finally, one of our fiscally sponsored programs, MVLA Scholars, they give scholarships to kids who are typically first in their family to go to college. They're doing a tremendous job of raising money and giving that, those scholarships to local students. Uh, in terms of our community grants, the um, distribution is a lot of it's for youth and education, some for what we call vulnerable populations. This is homelessness, helping people who are uh, struggling, seniors, health and safety, environment, community building, and arts and culture. And this is just a sampling of, of some of the grant, uh, grantees. So. Um, you can see in each of these areas. And again, some of these are our donor advised fund owners, like KQED. KQED is not necessarily local, so we won't give a community grant to them, but our donor advised fund owner might. And then uh, some of the others, like uh, Los Alto Stage, the History Museum, those are obviously local grants that we've given. All right, so one of the things we do, which is a little bit unusual for community foundations, is we run uh, direct and fiscally sponsored programs. Our direct programs are ones that we make sure they happen, and either through volunteers or through um, paid staff um, or contractors, we, we um, make sure these programs happen. Um, E3 Youth Philanthropy, this is a program that um, is for high school youth. They learn all about nonprofits, um, service, and we give the program $10,000 of grant money, and then they evaluate grant applications, give out uh, about five, six grants every spring. So that's a wonderful program being run by uh, Judy Crates, and it has about 25 students in it. It's a two-year program, so students go typically in their 10th or 11th or 11th and 12th grades. And it's just an extraordinary program. It's been going on for probably uh, 12, 12 years now, and, and uh, it's graduated a lot of students. Um, a year or so ago, we did a really interesting project where um, Dennis wanted to donate a car, 
and he wanted to do it in a creative way, so he asked the youth philanthropy students to figure out who to give the car to. And, um, you know, they had no clue, coming from Los Altos, who to, who to give a car to. So we, we worked in collaboration with a community services agency, CSA, Tom Myers, and he came up with some, um, they went through their client database and came up with some prospective families who would be ap appropriate recipients for this car. And the students evaluated, you know, the different students and worked with Tom and finally, you know, decided that this is the family to get the car. And um, so in December a year ago, they presented the car to the family one afternoon. So it was very, very um, eye-opening for the students. And of course, in the end result, um, Dennis was able to donate his car to a family in the community, and it was really a, um, just a really great uh, partnership. Uh, the lead class, many of you are familiar with that. That's the class that Claudia Coleman has been leading for a number of years. It's a fabulous course to teach all about the local nonprofits, uh, schools, um, municipal organizations, and who the leaders are. And um, the intention is that the participants in this class can learn about opportunities for where they can get involved in the community. How many have gone through the lead class here? <laughs> okay, good, good, yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, so, and look at you, look where you are now. I went through the lead class too, so it's, it's a, it's really a really great class. Um, Black Action Teams, that was started about three years ago, no, about five, six years ago by Sherry Dodsworth around emergency preparedness. The idea, the idea is that neighborhoods organize for disaster preparedness. We have a great partnership going with the city now. Uh, Ann Heppenstall is their emergency preparedness coordinator. And also we're coordinating with the police department who has the neighborhood watch. So uh, the block action teams is all about trying to make neighborhoods safer, more resilient, and also more connected. You know, we're really encouraging people to have parties and events to, to really get to know your neighbors. With the end result that people will help each other be more caring, and we'll have a closer community. So we have about uh, 20, 20 to 25 percent of the community covered now with block action team neighborhoods. We call them BATS. BATS, that's right, the BAT program. And um, so we're always looking for new BAT leaders. If you want to, I think Gary is a, a newly trained. Working on it. Working on it, yeah. So I'm, Gary. I'm on the other side of things, CERTs and BATS. OK, good, CERTs yeah. Are training in emergency preparedness and the BATS are sort of bringing the neighborhoods together. Right. And um, we work, BATS and CERTs work together. Exactly, yeah. So it's a great uh, partnership with the city. And that's one of the things we really try to do is um, partner with other organizations as it makes sense. And this partnership with the city is a, is a great one. Uh, we have a mediation program. And then the Neutcher House, um, we manage. And as a uh, conference facility, King Lear does that. Many of you have been involved with that. And um, so he uses the profits from the rentals to, to maintain the house. We moved that house over from Marvin Avenue a number of years ago, raised money, restore, restored it. In fact, we have the record for moving the most houses in Los Altos. We, <laughs> we moved two. Uh, we moved the Neutra House. And then the community house, our office, was over here uh, right where the Park Regent condos are by the Demartini Orchard Stand, and we moved that in the uh, 97, 1997, and refurbished it, and now it's our office. Okay, uh, now the fiscally sponsored programs, these are a way that people can see a need in the community and address it under our umbrella. So basically, we, we offer our 501c3 umbrella, so a program can work on its mission and not worry about the administrative tax financial details. We'll take care of that, both front office and back office. So um, there's a whole variety of these and there's no like real rhyme or reason to them where it's more like is there a need? And so um, Shali and Cynthia are involved with uh, CAFE which was started by Annabelle Pelham a number of years ago for um, making uh, communities more uh, age friendly. Um, a brand new one is Community Women's Course. So this is a group of women who um, 
seen primarily at senior facilities. So it's kind of a double win because we're allowing these women to get together and sing, but at the same time, they're going around and singing at various senior facilities around the area. Yeah. So if I may, the, the incubated program, the word incubated is important because he's listing the ones there that we, that the community foundation currently incubates, but there have been some significant graduates. Sure. Because these are programs that are just, somebody has an idea, let's see if it has traction, can go somewhere. Women SV, Mentor Tutor Connection, there have been a couple of others who LACF incubated and then they got their own 501c3 right. and became their own organization. Right. So it's a wonderful service to the community in that it lets people try out an idea. It's yeah. going to work. Yeah. And as, as uh, Dennis mentioned, some of them go off to become their own. Some of them go off and merge. Some of them just fizzle away, right? Either because the need goes away or the person leading it just never quite got it together. And that's, you know, it's kind of like the tech startup world, right? You know, there's obviously going to be great tech startups, and, and then there are others that just never make it. And it's a similar thing. Yeah. Um, also, um, proud to say that LACC is a um, LACF sponsored, uh, private, um, yeah. sponsored Well, not officially. We're not. No, you're not. Um, <laughs> LACC, <laughs> LACC is, is, I mean, we've been, see, that's one of the flexible things. We do a lot of support through sponsorships and stuff, but you're not an organization that's officially, fiscally sponsored by us because you're just kind of a group. Pardon? We're, we're under the table. Yeah, you're under the table. <laughs> now, Los Altos Forward, First Fridays are fiscally sponsored, but the LACC, we've been, you know, that and other events we've helped over the yes. years through sponsorships of like the uh, candidates forum and stuff, but it's not an official sponsor forum. Uh, Greentown, Greentown was with us, started with us, went away and went under Actera and then decided it was, they'd rather come back home and um, be with us. <laughs> And the reason is they went to Actera because Actera is very environmentally focused, but then they realized Greentown is a very community focused organization and being with the Community Foundation was a lot, a lot better for allowing them to be connected with the community. And so that makes a lot of sense. So Greentown, um, house to home, listos, this is like a, emergency preparedness for de deportation. So there's a number of women working over at the Castro School in um, Mountain View to help immigrant families kind of prepare their documents should one or both the parents get um, deported. And so they're providing that and other services for these, these families. Los Altos Ford, you're all very familiar with this. They've done the placemaking, community uh, conversations, and then a spur of that, so to speak, is First Fridays. And what's really cool is to see these things evolve because, you know, First Friday, I, I started that back in 2011, and Los Altos Ford got going with his community conversations, and then um, Club 55 came out of that. The, the coalition kind of grew out of this. So over time, different things grow out of these, and, you know, I'm, I'm real happy that we're able to start this and kind of nurture them along so that people can experiment and try different things. Um, MVLA Scholars is raising scholarship money. Uh, this one is for high school boys to learn about service. This is for young, young ladies to learn about service. So they're, they're similar, but you know, one's for uh, boys and one's for girls. Uh, community Garden over Mountain View. Uh, Taco, a lot of you are familiar with that. That's the community orchestra. So it's a, it's a wide breadth of, of um, programs. Yeah. I just want to say Um, we're grateful to be one of your fiscally sponsored programs at the CAFE because we're a small organization and we can focus completely on our mission and right. not have to worry about all the, the front office and back office stuff. Right, right. Uh, whoops. Um, so this slide kind of illustrates what fiscal sponsor is about. So somebody finds a community need, uh, sees a community need. So this brilliant social entrepreneur says, hey, we should do a nonprofit. And so we'll provide the fiscal sponsorship. And then we nurture the program along. And so we provide all kinds of benefits. So meeting space, uh, the tax exempt funds so people can uh, take donations. So you know, we'll process donations, record those in a database, um, send out thank you letters and all that. Uh, we'll give out grants. Um, 
we, we can host websites, so a number of our program websites are under our website, so it gives them you know, effectively free hosting. Uh, tax filing, liability insurance, reporting, donor database, marketing, publicity. So we give the, the program all these uh, little benefits with the idea that it'll grow from a little seedling to a large redwood tree and go off and become its own. So, um, and indeed, some of them do do that. Yeah. Again, Joe, from a tax perspective, if I may, um, it also allows <coughs> a donor advised fund then to fund the seedling idea in a tax deductible thing. So I know with uh, one of the group's slobs, I think it was, you know, they had this idea and they'd been doing this thing, but they were doing it with after-tax dollars. And all of a sudden, okay, we can get this thing going and I can start a donor advised fund and I can fund this idea of mine in a tax deductible manner. So there are some nice benefits. Yep. Well, when I, I was meeting with Bart and Kim and Robin back in 2011 when our downtown was kind of struggling. Struggling more than now, believe it or not. Um, and uh, we came up with the first Friday idea and we said, yeah, let's do it, you know. Uh, get the merchants to stay open one night a month, uh, two hours late, you know, so that was like a radical idea. But then I went home that night and started thinking, um, wow, um, I don't want to take money. No, first of all, no one's going to give me money for sponsorships, right? Joe's first Friday. And I don't want money in my personal bank account. And what about insurance if someone falls off the curb? And, you know, you know, if we do ads in the town crier, do I have to pay those out of my pocket? And so uh, Kim came over and talked to Roy about fiscal sponsorship, and Roy agreed, of course. And all of a sudden, we have the credibility of the Community Foundation, it's like better than the Federal Reserve. And, <laughs> and I could go around to merchants and um, solicit sponsorships, and it would go into our fund. I took out ads in the town crier and had other expenses, and then we had liability insurance. So everything was covered, so I could focus on just, uh, with, the, with the team of volunteers I had, we could focus on uh, the first Friday. And it was, you know, it was fun, it worked, and we didn't have to worry about all the details. So uh, that's the nice thing about fiscal sponsorship. Uh, we're also trying to foster volunteerism, and we're doing that in a number of ways. One of the big things that's coming up in a, in a couple weeks here is Compassion Week, and this is a really interesting um, event. So this was originally started by the uh, Los Altos United Methodist Church a number of years ago, and they've been running it. This year, they wanted to see if they could get partners to, to participate, and so we um, were a partner. We gave them a grant to support it. Um, Rotary's a partner. Uh, there's a number of other faith communities that are partnering with it. And um, so the whole idea is it's a week of volunteering. And so I encourage you and your families or, or friends to think about uh, participating in this. And the website's right there. So it's between the 30th of September and October 6th. But this is really great because um, the Community Foundation really hasn't done a lot with the faith community over the years, and yet it's a, it's a wonderful community of people who want to do good in the world. And so I think this is a first step toward um, um, working together with, with that uh, group of people, or group of organizations, actually. And so um, we're excited about that. Uh, we just did the nonprofit volunteer fair in late August on the downtown green, and, and that was a, a fun event. We had about 29 nonprofits table there. Um, we have an online volunteer directory, uh, which people can look at, and it's got volunteer opportunities based on, uh, you know, youth, uh, um, adults, teams, and so forth. And um, of course, our fiscally sponsored programs have a lot of opportunities. Our MVLA Scholars Program, uh, they have probably 120 volunteers who are mostly mentors for the students in the program. Um, and then we've been doing the John W. Gardner uh, Volunteer Recognition Dinner. Um, we also do different events, the solstice uh, in June, our brunch, our brunch is coming up on the 13th of October, and we're gonna have Chris Degelmeyer of uh, Tide speak, so if you'd like to come to that, you can go to our website and sign up. And then we convene groups um, for different reasons. Recently, um, there's a, a, 
uh, I participated in a group of the alumni of the Spanish leadership program over in Mountain View. So the city of Mountain View has this leadership program that's uh, completely done in Spanish for, for Spanish residents. And so um, uh, they got together convening and we talked about it and found out you know, what their issues are. It was very, very interesting. You know, I had a translator translating things for me both ways, you know, I would speak in English and they'd translate in Spanish for some of the folks who couldn't even speak English and vice versa. So uh, that was really interesting to hear from them. So um, we do this in, in various aspects. So we're gonna be doing more of that. That's one of the primary areas that we think we can add value is through convening of groups. Um, so this is kind of a busy slide, but this is to the point that we're here to enable what your passions. So if you have ideas to help the community, we can help you probably in one way or another. So you see a community need. Um, you can create a fund. You can raise money for a cause. Um, there's all kinds of um, examples of people who have done that um, over time. Or you can start a fiscally sponsored program. Do you want to preserve or create a community asset? And Preserving an asset, such as the community and Neutra houses are examples. Um, also the house up in um, Foothill College, I forget that name of that older house. We were involved with preserving that at one time. Um, or you can raise money for a new one. And we were instrumental in, in having a fund and helping to raise community support to build a day worker center back in about um, 10, 12 years ago. So, um, it's really um, something we can facilitate with our funds and with our uh, marketing ability. Some people have honored or memor um, memorialized people. So um, there's the uh, bench right there in front of the town crier. That was uh, um, where someone raised money for that. The, the clock on the community center. Um, a group of people wanted to raise money for an organ for Mark Shaw, who was you know, at the high school. So those are just examples of, of that. Um, last, or was a year or two ago, there was a celebration for, or the um, commemoration for the um, Cradle of Liberty statue down in Shell Park, and we opened a fund and people could contribute to that. And the money for that went toward restoring the area around the statue, and then also at the end, the money went to the city for ongoing maintenance. Um, and of course, Bob Simon was really instrumental behind that. Um, start a scholarship fund, so we have a number of scholarship funds. Bring groups together to raise awareness or focus on an issue, so I talked about the evolution of First Friday for Los Altos Forward, Club 55, the coalition. You know, um, these groups keep going, which is great, and if we can help them in, in little ways, that's, that's great. And um, we're gonna help sponsor the uh, SPUR event here in, in two or three weeks. And so just things to help um, the conversation going. You know, we're a 501c3, so we can't do political advocacy, but anything we can do to educate and provide a broad um, perspective is, is definitely within our wheelhouse. Um, we also have a coordinate a, a common scholarship program, so all the local service clubs um, and other organizations used to have their own individual scholarship application. So imagine high school kids in January of their senior year, they have to apply to all these different organizations, get re letters of recommendations from, uh, for each application, get transcripts for each application. We have one common online scholarship application now that all the organizations participate in, so for the students, it's wonderful. They just fill out one application, one, letter, one set of letters of recommendation, uh, one set of transcripts. So it's easier for everybody. And the other benefit of this is that all these organizations get together. After they've looked at the applicants, they get together and kind of compare notes. And some applicants end up with a whole bunch of um, scholarships and they do a little redistribution to make it a little more uh, fair across the pool of applicants. Um, and then, you know, improve uh, the quality of life. So we're not all about trying to address homelessness or, you know, struggling needs. One of the big things about uh, what we try to do is a lot around community building and improving the quality of life of the community. 
To me, I've never flown an airplane, but to me, a community is kind of like flying an airplane, right? There's lots of different controls in an airplane. If you just focused on one control, the airplane wouldn't fly very well, right? You have to kind of do a little of everything. And, and so that's a lot of why we do a lot of broad activities. And to me, improve, uh, focus, or supporting the community, community's quality of life and community building is, is a big aspect of, of what we can do to help the community. Um, so all these kind of things I just talked about turn themselves into funds, right? So we have nonprofit designated funds. So we have, uh, when you donate to the Festival Lights Parade, that comes into a fund at LACF, and then they use that money for the parade. Uh, the Village Association has a fund, and that money, because the Village Association is not a 501c3, they have a fund with us, uh, which is uh, tax deductible. And that money is used for free public benefit activities like the flower pots and the signs downtown, things that the public can enjoy for free. And so it's kind of an interesting arrangement. So um, it's, it allows people to contribute to the beauty of our downtown through the uh, lava. Uh, Walter and Marie Singer, who were legendary in our town um, 20, 30 years ago, uh, they created an endowment with us. It's three quarters of a million dollars. It's a designated fund, meaning every year the earnings from that are designated for 10 different uh, local charities. And they set that up before they passed away. And now every year it, it provides uh, benefit to those charities. And there's a fund for the uh, future swimming pool. And uh, <laughs> you know, whenever that happens. <laughs> so. Uh, that was raised, you know, back in 2000 when the Covington Pool was um, dismantled with the idea that one would soon be built after that, and unfortunately it hasn't. Um, funds for local causes. So Friends of Historic Redwood Grove, this is a group of citizens that were, um, are focused on saving the Halsey House, so they created a fund and raised money for that. Um, in conjunction with the CERTs, there's a group of people raising money for um, local ham radios or the, the radios that are spread around town to be used during a disaster. Um, there's a fund for the youth theater. So some students participating in the youth theater um, can't afford the, the tuition. And so um, this provides scholarships for these students so that they can um, participate in the youth theater um, even though they, they can't financially afford it. Uh, we have a number of scholarships on donor advised funds. So as I mentioned, these are similar to a private foundation. Um, we have grant making funds. We have our endowment. In our endowment, we're focusing on plan giving. Uh, the idea is that as people pass away, they leave a portion of their estate to the community foundation, and then that will be used to help the community forever. So we have uh, 45 families now, um, including Vicki and Dave, who have um, left some portion of their estate, oh, Dennis also, some portion of their estate to the community foundation with the idea that it will help the community forever. When you think about it, um, some people give $1,000 a year to the community foundation. Well, if you gave 25,000 once, then 4% of that is a typical endowment payoff. If you gave 25,000 once, that would pay $1,000 forever, you know, every year annually, right, just on the earnings. So that's the power of legacy giving. Um, people can leave a chunk of money. And you know, when you think about it, most people when they pass away, their kids are in their 60s and hopefully they don't need a lot of support by then, right? <laughs> and so, you know, we're, our pitch is basically give a little back to the community. It's been so good for you and your family and to help the community over the long term. And that's, that's the whole purpose of uh, building an endowment. We have a reserve, of course. Um, each of our programs has a fund. And then we have a couple of nonprofit investment funds, and this is, this is where the History Museum and Metro Tudor Connection and, and one other uh, legacies, um, they put their money with us, but it's still their money. So it's, to us, it's both an asset and a liability, but the reason they do that is so that they can take advantage of our um, investment program. Um, well, I think the point there is we have professional managers yeah. working with as well as architects. And rather than, you know, a lot of these money managers, they won't take less than half a million dollars or sometimes a million dollars. It allows them to piggyback on LACF funds and get professional yep. management for their fund. 
Yeah. So um, our assets are now um, $17 million, but that $17 million is spread across all these 100 funds. So donor advised funds, for example, are $8.5 million, and each of these are a portion of that $17 million. And, um, and then the endowment is about $2 million, so we're continuing to try to build that up. So the thing about a community foundation is it's a big collection of funds. We have over 100 different funds of all different types. And, and so if you look at our 990, you'll see, well, you have 17 million of assets. And you go, wow, that's incredible. Well, very little, little of it is our, um, under our discretion. Most of it is designated for one purpose or another. Um, I always have to, you know, uh, let people know how they can give back to the community. So we do our annual fundraising. The idea is it helps us every day. Um, donor advised funds are the uh, vehicle for people to create a fund and then grant out of it. Legacy giving and then volunteering. So these are the, kind of the primary uh, ways that people can uh, give back through LACF. Okay. Um, we just finished what we call a strategic framework, a strategic planning process, and it's not a radical departure, but there are some differences from, or some fine tuning from what we have been doing. So for example, uh, our mission is a little revised. Uh, you saw that at the beginning, but we're all about inspiring, leading, and empowering residents and organizations for a stronger community. And our three primary goals kind of key right off of this mission, right? So. We're trying to inspire increased local philanthropy, trying to get more people to give and give locally. Uh, many of you may have heard of what uh, the study called the Giving Code that was done a couple years ago. The idea is there's a huge amount of wealth in the valley, but a lot of it goes elsewhere and out of the valley. And so there's a big effort to try to encourage people to give locally to support their local community. And we're trying to encourage that and do more in that area. Uh, lead, convene, and collaborate to um, accelerate effective solutions. So we did a lot of uh, uh, interviews and focus groups last fall, about a year ago, before we in, in the process of doing this. And what, one of the things that we heard a lot about was that we could provide value by convening and collaborating of groups in the, in the community. And so we're going to be doing more of that. Um, our participation in Compassion Week, for example, is a, is a great example of that. Um, two or three years ago, we did uh, something called Inspire Mountain View, where we raised money from tech companies over in Mountain View, over a half million dollars, into a fund. And we ran a grants challenge and gave out nine grants to uh, nonprofits who did things to improve Mountain View. So, you know, we've done a number of these over the years, and we're going to continue to do them. Um, we want to continue to increase the capability of nonprofits and individuals. So what can we do to make nonprofits more effective? Also individuals. So you know, things like the LEAD program and other programs like that help individuals be more effective and better leaders. And we want to look at uh, additional things in that area. And then we believe we are, and we want to continue to be a valued, sustained contributor to the community. So um, and then the final thing is, um, and this, believe it or not, was a lot of discussion within internally, but we are saying that we're appropriately serving the communities of Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, and Mountain View. So we're, um, we've done a lot in Mountain View, for example, over the years, and we'll continue to do that, but we'll do it in an appropriate way because what we do in Mountain View uh, may make sense for there, but not here, and, and we're certainly not going to lose focus on Los Altos. All right, so um, with that, I'd open it up to any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Kathy. Um, so one of the concerns from some other nonprofits I'm involved with, with was with the new tax law, that it would change the way people are making their philanthropic contributions. Uh, that there was less incentive for people to create the donor advised fund and to donate through IRAs if they were of a particular you know, demographic. Are you guys seeing the, any shift in terms of how the money is flowing into the organization? So that, what uh, Kathy is referring to is, you know, the, it's like 25,000 threshold before you can deduct charitable deductions. And that was with the December 17 tax law. Uh, we haven't seen a lot 
yet, but I think this fall will be the real test because people, you know, they did their 18 taxes last April, and that's when they really saw the effect of it. And so um, we'll see. But the point is, uh, you can only deduct 10,000 of uh, local property taxes, state and local taxes, and then you, if you have mortgage in, uh, interest, then that might take you up over 25,000. So 10 plus, say, say if you have 15 of mortgage interest, then you're okay. But if you're an older person, perhaps and you don't have a mortgage, or you have low property taxes, that won't add up to 25, and so your charitable deductions are not deductible. And so, yeah, that's a concern for us and a lot of, a lot of people. The nice thing about a donor advised fund is you can do what's called bunching, and Dennis loves this, but the idea is that um, it, you can, say you give 5,000 a year to charity, okay, just as a an example. You can, what you can do in, um, with the donor advised fund is you could put 15,000 in one year, be able to deduct that as a charitable deduction and then give five out the next three years. You know, um, and so you, you're not hurting the charity, but at the same time you're getting your deduction by doing that bunching amount. So that's one of the new advantages of a, of a donor by son based on the tax law. Okay, other questions? Yeah, Margo. Thanks, this is wonderful. Um, if you were to say what you, your signature um, on the, on the um, LACF is, what, you know, over your tenure, what, how, how do you describe that, what, what your impact has been? Sure. I think, um, well, I've been doing a lot of things. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I think strategically, getting us more involved and engaged with organizations around the community, uh, Los Altos community, Mountain View community. So we're well known among the municipal organizations, nonprofits, um, <laughs> schools, and, and other organizations. I think that's uh, you know, a, a very important aspect and where we can add more value. The faith community, as I mentioned, we had never really done anything with the faith community. So just establishing those relationships so people better understand you know, what we're doing and um, what our value is, I think is, is really key. And then, you know, fostering all the little efforts, I call them little, but, you know, they're important. All the efforts that you're, you're all doing, you know, like, um, you know, and helping out a little bit on the affordable housing effort, right? So, you know, anything we can do to nudge along or support the efforts you're doing is important. Um, you know, I've done a lot of stuff, what I call under the hood, you know, internally, process-wise, um, you know, just a lot to make us more efficient. But the more important thing is um, what I've done it allows us to provide more, um, um, better customer service, basically. Customer service to our donors and the community. And so that's why that process stuff is important. But again, I don't brag about that because people don't see that externally, but it's, it allows us to be more uh, responsive and provide uh, be more scalable so we can we can grow we've grown a lot you know we've our assets have grown three times and donations have doubled and um, our donor advised funds have um, uh, grown by ten times so it's not all my doing but it's just you know things are in place so that we can grow and, and provide better service to the community yeah Elizabeth um, can you discuss a little bit your relationship with the Packard Foundation? Do you have something in place with that, or did I misunderstand? Yeah, so um, the Packard Foundation has been giving us a re-granting grant since 2007. They used to grant to all individual organizations around the community, and then they realized that, first of all, the grants were smaller, and, and for them, a five or $10,000 grant is you know, a lot of work, and, and um, you know, it's tough to deal with. And they also realized that we knew the community better than them. Um, so that's been going on. Now, they are actually, to be honest, ramping that down. And the reason they're ramping that down is because they're totally bought off on this giving code study, which I mentioned earlier. The idea that there's lots of wealth in the Valley, and it's up to us and other nonprofits to extract that. And so they're willing to support what they call capacity building. Capacity building is where nonprofits, you know, take time to uh, become better at something. And so they're supporting capacity building efforts to help nonprofits be better at fundraising. Um, 
but the regranting is going to start to ramp down. So we're going to look at how we can best help nonprofits, either through grant making or other methods, um, and how we uh, uh, transition from that regranting grant to some other method. We do intend to continue grant making to local nonprofits. It's just you know how and and the and the um, uh, algorithms for you know. Uh, deciding how to do that will be evolving over time. And that's part of our strategic framework work that we're working on. Uh, Gary. So I think we only have time for a very quick question. Oh, Gary, can you do a quick question? <laughs> I didn't see any uh, support for climate change uh, activities per se. Uh, and that's uh, the focus of the march from the two high schools today going to uh, the city hall in, in uh, in Mountain View. It's kind of the Greta Thunberg uh, story. Uh, the, the teenager from Sweden who came over and said, you know, if the house is on fire, you don't study it. You put the fire out. And that's what they're trying to do. Uh, we're putting most of our eggs in the Greentown basket. <laughs> so we're, we're counting on Greentown. Uh, we do support other environmental organizations like grassroots ecology and canopy and school activities. You know, there's various school activities. But, you know, um, Greentown is, you know, where we're putting a lot of uh, support for our local effort. Um, you know, if you remember that pie chart, environment is, is, is a relatively small sliver. We s focus mostly on social, social and, um, you know, uh, youth, seniors, families, you know, social issues. Um, seniors was a 2% pie slice. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm just very curious about that. Yeah, well, those are, so that's a little deceptive because the, the question is, why does our senior slice only show 2%? Those are to specific senior organizations. I mean, part of it is based on the grants we get. On the other hand, we do support efforts like Club 55 and um, other activities, CAFE, and other activities going on that do, I'm sorry? CSA. Yeah, CSA. So there's a lot of other areas we support seniors through. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Joe. And I don't know, if Joe, if you're going to hang around for a few minutes afterwards. Sure. Um, so before we head out, we have about five more minutes left. I just wanted to tell everybody, uh, the Community Coalition has two uh, fabulous meetings coming up. October 4th, Jessica Spicer, who is the president of the Los Alto School District Board of Trustees, is coming to talk about the community engagement process and how we're going to work towards a solution <laughs> to finding facilities for the charter school. Um, it's going to be a much more of a process-focused discussion. And then on October 16th, very excited to announce that we have um, the policy director from the San Jose office of SPUR, which is San Francisco Barrier Urban Research something, something, something. Uh, she's going to come and talk um, about how we can create a community that's economically prosperous, inclusive, and still retain what we like most about Los Altos. It is possible. And so we are going to have an, an evening event about that. I, you kind of look a little skeptical, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so anyway, so look out for that invitation. Uh, that event is co-sponsored by um, Los Altos Affordable Housing Alliance. <laughs> uh, Cafe, of course, can't forget our seniors. Um, what else am I missing? Oh, the Community Foundation yeah. is also co-sponsoring it. It will be at the Covington Multi on October 16th, 6.30 to 8 p.m. So you'll be getting more information about that. Um, I'd like to open it up to any announcements from the floor. Gary, Margo, oh, Elizabeth. The, just it, because we are here with LACF and LACF has sponsored, is one of our, uh, we also have sponsorship from Cal Water, but we are opening an exhibition at the Los Altos History Museum on October 17th, which for those of you with a good memory will know, 30 years ago was the date of the Loma Prieta earthquake. So the exhibition is something um, we're doing with the city's emergency preparedness coordinator and uh, and LACF is one of our one of the sponsors for that exhibition. So it'll be up through January 19th, and um, lots of great information about how to be prepared for all sorts of different types of natural disasters, not just earthquakes. But it will also include um, look back at some of our historic events here in town. So thank you for the support. Sure.
All right, thank you. Uh, so a couple of things I just want to let know, people know what's going on in downtown. On this uh, Sunday is the Corvette Spectacular. Uh, so if you like cars, come on down for that. Uh, and then uh, I, I sometimes think that we're the, you know, we're Los Altos nonprofit alcohol provider. And so on Friday, the 27th is a beer stroll in downtown Los Altos. So uh, tickets are available for that. Uh, come down and visit a number of our, our businesses and, and uh, taste some of our local craft brews. And building on the wonderful beer stroll, uh, Club 55 will have its Oktoberfest on the first Friday of October. That'll be the last uh, Club 55 event for the season, and then we'll start again next May with Margaritaville. <laughs> Okay, no beer uh, involved in this one. This is high school students, and uh, it, it, it's, it's, we hope. Uh, there's uh, quite an interest in doing this, but anyway, they're going to leave uh, uh, Los Altos High School, march down Almond, El Monte, and uh, El Camino, and make it to City Hall. They, they're going to march between 10.30 and 1130, and they would like adults to join them for this march. And then there will be some speeches uh, at City Hall, uh, this is sponsored by in uh, the high school here. It's a climate justice coalition, and the high school at Mountain View is a, called Sunrise. So there's, there's a lot of interest by the kids. Hi. Um, yeah. I'm thinking about it. I have to be at the high school at 11.30. That's hopefully they'll be gone. Uh, I just want to let you, let you know if you haven't seen the hot show playing at Los Altos Stage, it's called Admissions. It's about college admission, and there's a fabulous 18-year-old acting star over there that you're going to see in the future. So see him now for a mere $35 or $30 ticket. Uh, th this next weekend, the show closes on the 29th, so you have uh, tonight, tomorrow, Sunday, and next weekend, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And there are still tickets available, and we'd really love to have your support. And if any of you have never been there, come talk to me. I might have something special for you. And talk about our show. Oh, yeah. Uh, Larry and I just did it. Larry and I and a few other people. Um, Larry is quite... No, not that. Well, that was the 40... Go to YouTube and you can see Elizabeth and me acting the, our pants off in Larry's 48-hour film festival project. But this is a, a, a cable access show called In the Know. Mike Kasperzak is the host. And we did a, a talk show last week with Peter Landsberger and me uh, talking about admissions and about the issues around college admissions, wealth, white privilege. All these things are touched on in this play. So it's hot. Go see it. We need your help. said about uh, admission is the best show of the last 18 years. It's fantastic. Uh, hey. um, I also wanted to just uh, give a big, big thanks to Joe for his service. Um, it's just been terrific working with LACF and everything they do for the community. It's if you look at all the slides and think about where we were 10 years ago and where the town is now, it's pretty incredible. So to me, that's a, a very, he's been such a um, sort of solid, quiet force just continuing to advance what um, people feel is in the best interest of the community. So, you know, big thanks. Thanks, David. Thank you. Enjoy your weekend.